How have the practices of an orthopedic surgeon changed over these years? We'll find out tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. This is our first show of the 15th season and we're ready to get started. Orthopedics is the medical specialty concerned with the correction of deformities or functional impairments of the skeletal system, especially the extremities and the spine and associated structures such as muscles and ligaments. In other words, the hard and soft structures of the body that let us move about. With advancements in pain and inflammation meds and the new ways of surgery, how have treatments changed? First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. In the United States, according to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, how many knee replacements are done each year? A, 175,000, B, 257,000, C, a million, 25 million, 1.25 million, D, 600,000. Viewers who call in the correct answers will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderfully uh, creative uh, photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get in your answers, but we have the whole show to get your questions in. We answer your medical questions about orthopedics as they're called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is Dr. Mark Harlow, Black Hills Occupational Medicine, Rapid City, South Dakota, an orthopedist who also volunteers to the reservations does a lot of other volunteer work too. Tell us a little bit about your, your background, Mark. I mean, you came, you're not originally from South Dakota. No, I grew up in Wisconsin. And, uh, so you're a real cheesehead. I am indeed, I am but, indeed. And, and uh, you went to high school in a smaller town? A small town of about 4,000 people in southeastern Wisconsin called Burlington, Wisconsin. And you were drawn to college by what? Well, I wasn't thinking much about college until coaches came knocking on our door and uh, were offering us scholarships. If I would play football, they would pay for my college, so that became an easy choice. And It boiled down to Wisconsin and Northwestern, and I chose Northwestern and uh, played there for, for three years and then uh, moved on to uh, work in Special Olympics for a time, which is a particular pet project of mine. And then my first job out of college was out in California. So you were an engineering student? I studied engineering at Northwestern. So tell us about this uh, California experience. It's very interesting. It was very uh, formative in, in my life's choices. I had the great privilege of working under the tutelage of Dr. Jacqueline Perry, who was the second orthopedist in the country. Uh, who was a board certified uh, female. She's and, not, she's not oh, alive anymore? No, she was in her early 60s when I was in my early 20s but I was fortunate to be given a research assignment with her and work shoulder to shoulder with her. And uh, my second year with her, uh, she came into my workspace and said to me that she thought maybe I didn't quite belong here in the, in the lab. And I thought, uh, did I just get fired? And she went on to say, I know how you think, I see how you work, and I think you need to become an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, you won't be happy in this job 10 years from now, and I think this is the path you should follow. And Dr. Perry, uh, didn't take no for an answer and uh, she helped me with a life choice that uh, has been a great blessing to me. I was, uh, she saw something in me I didn't see myself and uh, I owe her a debt I could never repay. But as I've mentioned to you, I have tried to serve that role for a lot of other young people through the years and helping them define their life's path and so. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, this experience of uh, going to med school. Where did the, or you went to Wisconsin? Medical College of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And then residency in, in orthopedics. In Milwaukee as well in orthopedics, yes. I, uh, I was fortunately naive when I went to medical school. It was with the intention of becoming an orthopedist because of my work with Dr. Perry. And uh, I didn't realize it was hard to get into, so things worked out favorably for me. But it was 
it was uh, not a guarantee. And no. uh, I had a great experience in Milwaukee. I had great mentors. Um, very fortunate to have trained there. And um, that's where you did your orthopedic. My orthopedic residency, uh, as well as my four years med school. So I was in Milwaukee for nine years, and then uh, had a fellowship in, in Utah, the University of Utah. Which in was in the joint replacement. Now that was kind of early on, wasn't it? it or was. Yes, fellowships are very common today. That was really on the early edge of, of the fellowships. In orthopedics, there are six sub-disciplines that you can choose to do fellowships in, and I, I enjoyed the joint replacement uh, surgery, both from the technical aspects as well as from the patient satisfaction aspects, and that's why I chose that as my specialty. And we want to talk about joint replacement, and I think it's really something that our audience would like to hear a lot about, but I want to go one little corner and talk about um, your sports thing. Yeah, so you don't play football anymore. No, I coached for a number of years out in Rapid City, but now that my kids are grown and building their own families, I, I spend my time coaching in Special Olympics. So th this is interesting. Tell me about the Special Olympics, and I think this is important for our, our viewers to understand. So what do you do in sport, the sport, uh, Special Olympics now? Well, we have sports that go right around the calendar. Every month on the calendar, we have a sport going. Uh, we have opportunities for athletes from age 8 to age 80. In Rapid City, we have two programs, one that deals mostly with our younger athletes, and then the older athletes are cared for and have their programs through the Black Hills Works. And we have programs all across the state now. We have over 2,000 registered Olympians in the state of South Dakota. So, I mean, th this is a national organization, Special Olympics, right? International. Okay, so in South Dakota, there it's also a state organization. There is. And you're involved with the state organization? I am the chairman of Special Olympics South Dakota. Our headquarters are in Sioux Falls. We have a great staff that works full time in, in the programming for Special Olympics. And we are just about to have our grand opening for the country's first Unify Center in Sioux Falls. Unify? The, unify meaning a way of bringing athletes together with their peer groups from their schools, from their communities, and providing opportunities for our athletes to be part of the fabric of their community. We have three goals. We have the, the goal of providing opportunity, we have the goal of providing respect for our athletes, and then also the goal of the opportunity for inclusion. And um, we really work hard to establish those with, with our local programs as well as with our state programs. Our athletes have opportunities to participate in, well, in our part of the world, 10 different sports right around the calendar. And they pick the ones they most enjoy, and we have volunteer coaches, and we have fundraising organizations. One of the things we've done in Rapid City that I'm really proud of is We've established a program where our athletes that are in high school can earn their varsity letters at their schools by virtue of participating in our Olympic programs. And we have a fundraising group that then raises the money to buy their jackets, have their letters sewn on, have their names embroidered on their jackets, and our athletes wear their school colors proudly. It's a great way to make them feel like they're part of their school group. Well, and they should be part and, of it. And we're trying to get that done statewide now. The Athletic Directors Association is working on that as a, a policy statement for all schools in the state that have special needs uh, students. Well, I know that you, this is not just the, the only extra special thing that you do for people outside of, uh, uh, that you volunteer for. But let's get back to orthopedics just a little bit. And we're gonna, we have a question about how long recovery and rehabilitation after hip surgery. Um, hip surgery happens, what percentage of the time after a fracture? What percentage of time uh, from just osteoarthritis, for example? More commonly from osteoarthritis. When you have a fractured hip, it usually doesn't break into the joint. So mother nature's perfect fit of ball and socket isn't disrupted in a fracture as commonly as the problem arises out of osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Almost all fractured hips require surgical stabilization, but that's a different operation than the replacement procedure. And the replacement procedure uh, is done when the ball and the socket no longer can live happily together. When mother nature's cushion is ground down and you have a round hole and a square peg effect. The question is about how long the recovery is. Yeah, it's, it's a highly variable time period. It depends on how bad the disease process has advanced. It depends on who uh, is the person with the worn out hip. If they have spent the last two years uh, sitting in the recliner. They putting, don't have a lot of muscles they, or tissues with which to connect. That's correct. Their, their muscular deconditioning 
is a big part of the recovery process. The operation only resurfaces the joint that is damaged in arthritic, and it takes away the pain from that, right. that poor fit, but it does nothing to make you stronger and nothing to make you more capable. That you have to earn back uh, as part of the rehab process or part of the prehab process. It's good to get people up and going as much as they can before their elective hip surgery so that they can be in good shape to, to withstand the trauma of the operation because it is traumatic. Yeah. How, uh, I think about uh, wh when they used to do it, they'd go in, they'd cut everything, put in the new stuff, and then they'd sew everything back up. But they're more and more trying to do it without cutting. Well, the minimally invasive techniques are what you're referring to, and they have a limited application. Uh, they are successful. Uh, it, it's a fairly steep learning curve. Uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should always be able to see what we're doing to give the best outcome. So sometimes you can do it with the x-ray machine, sometimes you need to directly visualize the socket so you can get it exactly aligned because the long-term uh, outcome of that hip is really based on how well the implants are positioned and secured. Uh, that's one element okay. of a successful surgery. The other is the, the right choice of a bearing surface. What makes these things fail over time is the generation of wear debris, whether it's between ball and socket or socket and the backside of the socket, whether it's breakdown of the glue that holds them in. Uh, sometimes we'll use cement on the older patients whose bone doesn't have as much capacity to have an ingrowth. But bottom line to answer this question is it's, it's depending upon how good a shape you're in before you come to surgery will, will in large part determine how long your recovery is. In the best case scenario, Every person that needed a hip replacement would be 120 pounds, be in 80 years shape. old, in perfect shape, and only walk to church on Sundays, okay. and we'd never have to redo them. But that's not the reality of right. what we face. Only well, uh, walk to church on Sundays. Sometimes patients uh, are in their 20s and have had a bad car accident, and their and their ball and socket no longer fit well together. So how can I, in good conscience, tell that person, well, I can help you when you're 60? but you have to live with this for the next 30 years. Well, that's unreasonable. So we do these operations in young people with the understanding that they have a finite lifespan, they will wear out someday, but your lifestyle choices will make them last longer, meaning no impact exercise, sensible choices. Um, the, right. more, the more you use them, the more they'll wear out. That's the sad news for me. Obviously, when you have a joint replaced, the actual operation is key, but what you do before and after the procedure is important as well. Absolutely true. I have arthritis and um, when I was a teenager I wasn't real good with my knees as a lot of teenagers are when they do sports and I uh, had a number of injuries with it, torn cartilage and uh, uh, things like that and uh, the doctor had been after me for five years to get them replaced and as, as he said you'll find the time when all of a sudden you can't stand it anymore the pain is too much and I reached that point and he said great let's do it in 10 days I had surgery on Friday got out of the hospital on Sunday and started physical therapy then on Monday and then I had it Monday Wednesday and Friday and I moved along good, as the therapist said. So I had it for eight weeks, and uh, then he said I reached all my goals, and I was on my own, and uh, I've been doing the exercises on my own since then. One of the big things was learning how to walk normally again. Uh, we spent an, a little bit of time with that. As you start developing more pain in your knees, you compensate with your gait, on a way that won't hurt as much, but that is not the correct gait. So we spent time with that. To begin with, with stretches. So both with the legs straight and then bending the knees up. And after you've had knee surgery, just even bending them up a little bit is discomfort because they're so tight. It's not necessarily pain as much as tightness. So you have to work through that tightness of it. And um, so a lot of stretching, um, standing up, keeping your feet on the floor, bending forward so you're stretching the back of your legs. And then, like I say, the bending of it. And that's where riding the exercise bike as you slowly move the seat down so you're bending a little bit more. After any surgery, people would understand, 
where after doing five or 10 minutes of walking, you're exhausted, but you need to get so you can get back into regular life by, by expanding that length of time that you're walking. So developing my endurance along with developing my uh, leg knee muscles again. That was one thing that I really thought my physical therapist was good at was being a coach and um, being a cheerleader, so to say, saying, no, you're right on schedule, you're doing everything right, it will get better, um, keep on doing what you're doing. So uh, for someone that's really active, the mental part is a, is a big part of it. Well, what they encouraged you to do was to get in as good a physical health as you can be. Uh, make sure you don't have any head cold, stomach problems, but also to, to exercise as much as you can beforehand, even though your, your knees are painful, um, not to quit doing everything, but to keep yourself um, as healthy as you can, as, as physically active as you can beforehand, because that'll help you afterwards. You can certainly get a lot of advice from people, but the big one is do your exercises, and that is very true. That was just great. Louise, such a beautiful, she's a nurse, you know, and has worked every job in that hospital of ours, and we all want her to stay in that particular job, and she just kind of creates things. She's a lovely lady, and as you can see, an illustrator with a, a beautiful word uh, ability. What, what, did, what did you take home from what she just said? I agree completely with her characterization of coach and cheerleader. I would always tell patients that we have a partnership agreement. My job is to do a good operation to a high degree of technical proficiency, but when the surgery is done, my job's mostly done. Now your work begins as my patient. Now you doing a good rehab is essential to a good outcome. So I need you to buy into the idea that your participation is essential. I can't just do a good operation. And physical therapists and occupational therapists are a huge asset and they make operate they make these operations ultimately successful right. I'm the coach and cheerleader and so too are their therapists right. so we have a question and I, you might want to use the illustrator the uh, telestrator to to work on this answer I had an MRI on my knee and have tears in my ACL and PCL I have been seeing a physical medicine doctor. Can this condition be cured with physical therapy or does it require surgery? In other words, if you tear that ACL, for example, do you always have to have surgery? Well, what, show us on the telestrator what is the ACL and the PCL. Well, on this angle, the anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate ligaments are here in the center portion of the knee. And they are your principal stabilizers from front to back. When your shin bone wants to slide out from under the thigh bone, it's right. the ACL and PCL that prevent that from happening, one forward, one backward. The presence of those tears alone is not an indication for surgery. The indication for surgery is whether or not the person that we're, we're answering this for has functional instability. If they have the knee giving way or slipping when they're climbing stairs or getting in, in or out of their car, then that constitutes an indication for surgery, not the presence of the tears themselves. So if this person is a highly active uh, athletic person, chances are those will need to be repaired. If it's a not very active sedentary person whose demands are low and they don't have functional instability, then they likely don't need to be repaired. Okay. Um, well, then looking at the picture, I'm reminded of the kneecap. Um, what in the heck does a kneecap do anyway, Mark? I, I, uh, what's its job? Its biomechanical purpose is to lengthen the lever arm for the quadriceps muscles. It moves okay. the vector for that motion okay. farther away Explain from the center that of the joint. Explain that visibly here. If this is the center of rotation of your joint, approximately, the kneecap moves that vector distance out a fair bit. So it's a little bit like moving farther out on the teeter-totter. The farther out you are, the more mechanical advantage you have to oh. lift the kid on the other side of the teeter-totter. Oh. This is the same concept, okay. is that by moving that tendon farther out, when this muscle contracts, it gives you a better mechanical advantage oh. to straighten the knee. Oh, it pushes the, 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 the tendon and the muscle further away, making it work better. 
I get it. Mm -hmm. So it, who designed this anyway, for goodness sake? <laughs> That's a smart uh, move, whoever good, made that move. Good design. Um, so uh, I like that idea. The question is, uh, can you cure it with physical therapy? Does it always require surgery? And it just depends upon the person. It depends upon the person and what their functional demands are and what their symptoms are. And my, my answer is always, you should be doing more. I mean, I truly believe, and I've pushed this, that bone on bone knee does not always mean you, you, uh, you have to have surgery. I mean, people who get up and get moving instead of letting the knee discomfort that they're having, they can build new cartilage, they can function better, they can improve on, uh, uh, reduce the amount of pain. You kind of stop nodding when I said build new cartilage. I've heard that before from orthopedic surgeons. What's your response? Well, I, I agree almost entirely with what you said. Uh, the reason for doing the replacement operation is to relieve pain. And I never presume to know what a patient is feeling better than they do. Right, right. I can't draw blood and check a pain level. Right. I can't x-ray pain. I can x-ray a bone on bone knee, but I don't know how much it hurts. And my students are always impressed when we have a patient who comes in in the morning with a bone on bone x-ray who says, I can't take another step. I need this thing repaired or replaced. And in the afternoon, a person with an identical x-ray comes in and says, you know, it kind of bugs me, but I can still get along pretty well, and I'd like a shot, and I'd like to go back to my ranch. So who gets the operation? The patient decides who gets the operation. Yeah. I never presume to tell them that I know better than they, that they've reached the point where they need it. And the pain is the reason, because that's all I can do with the operation is take away their pain. As I said before, I can't make them stronger. I can't make them more able. They have to earn that back. That's their part of our partnership. They have to work hard to regain that quality of life. And that's really what this operation is done for, is quality of life. Relief of pain equates to quality of life. So my question is always, when do you send that person to the orthopedic surgeon? I mean, when does that patient who's complaining of discomfort, when is it that it's time to do the knee or the hip? When is the right time to do surgery versus just rehab? That's a, that's a tough question. Well, after all conservative options have been exhausted is, is part of that answer. So they should have tried activity modification. They should have tried anti-inflammatory medication, perhaps uh, steroid injections into the knee, perhaps platelet-rich plasma, perhaps synvisc or visco supplementation, all of the other options that are out there. The point is to try conservative before surgical. That's almost always the first course. But when those are no longer effective and the person has pain that disables them to the point that they can't yep. live their customary lifestyle, whatever that is, whether it's walking from the kitchen to the living room without pain or whether it means working a ranch without pain, the threshold is really determined by the patient. And from our point of view, the threshold has to be an x-ray that indicates that the symptoms line up with what our expectations are. Because the operation is, we call it a total knee replacement. It really is a misnomer. It's a total knee resurfacing. We only cut a thin wafer of that damaged arthritic bone off and then recap it with a metal and plastic bearing. Draw on this what you do. On the, on the shin bone, the tibia, depending upon how much erosion of bone there is, sometimes we cut no bone off. But the amount of bone we cut off is a thin wafer here, and then we have multiple cuts on the femur to create a box cut so that the implant will fit squarely and securely on the femur. This has a stem in it that goes down into the shin bone to anchor it. We customarily cement it into place. The alignment of those implants is critical to its, uh, its successful outcome. So you have a new, a new surface there, surface. and then you have this squared off new, new surface here. That's correct. And uh, have I drawn that correctly? That's great. Yep, that's fine. Okay. And the kneecap gets resurfaced as well in most cases. The underside of oh, the really? kneecap, we flip the kneecap top for bottom, and then we cut off the damaged arthritic part and resurface that with a metal or plastic button as well. Most of them are plastic. Um, there have been some metal backed ones that tend to wear out a little quicker, but right. we have to make sure that that articulation is correct. The key for the surgeon is to make sure the cuts are, are properly aligned both uh, translationally and rotationally because if you get the rotation of the thigh bone component off then the kneecap won't sit in its normal groove and then the patient isn't happy so there are a lot of technical features that the surgeon has to bring to the table and that's right. why i say the technical proficiency of the operation is the surgeon's job the rehab is the patient's job now it was not too long ago that a patient came in with a worn out artificial knee mm -hmm. and and got new plastic inserts yes explain that 
Uh, and are they doing it now better so that you have a little zipper that you can unzip or a button that you can <laughs> unbutton or something? <laughs> Nothing quite that simple. No. I, I wish there was. The operation is far less traumatic, though, uh, if the patient only needs a polyethylene exchange. There is a, a modular capacity here where you can snap out the old damaged one and snap in a new one, usually a little thicker than the first one that went in to rebalance the ligaments. And then you sew the wound up, which is a lot less trauma to the body than cutting the bones, such as we do at the first operation. The body doesn't know the difference between me trying to help this patient and this patient falling and breaking their leg in multiple places, because that's what we do with the operation. In a controlled way, with the saw, we're breaking their shin bone, we're breaking their thigh bone, yeah. we're breaking their kneecap, and the body responds with the same shock response as it would as if it had had a bad trauma. Okay. So. And I've got a great question about a bunion thing, but I want to go one next step, and that is I saw a patient who, following the surgery, it hurt. She didn't want to move the knee, couldn't get her to move her knee, she wouldn't follow on the, on the, uh, the push to get moving, mm -hmm. and the pain accelerated, and she could never use that knee. I mean, she just lost the game. I mean, I, she could use it uh, a little bit, but uh, I sense that the real problem that, f that caused failure, because that's what it was, it, it, it was an unhappy uh, consequence, was because she just couldn't push through the pain to get rehabilitation. Is that true? Do you see that? Oh, yes, it? that is a pain. Postoperative pain is a huge part of one's ability to progress through the uh, therapeutic milestones. Uh, there are pain strategies that are evolving all the time, including the ones that we administer at surgery to try to get them out of the hospital more quickly. But uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, the, the alarm clock that no matter how many times you hit the button won't turn off, is a real problem when you have major trauma to a joint, whether it's vehicular trauma or in this case whether it's surgical trauma and it can be very problematic. Uh, what I have done in those cases is early on in the process is to take them back to surgery and do a manipulation under anesthesia. So that, sure that they can move. They can still bend and then I take a photograph of the knee at 120 degrees of bend and I give them a copy of that to put on their bathroom mirror and on their refrigerator so that every day they can see it here's can how bend. much your knee can work <laughs> and then I send it to my colleagues who are pain management specialists who may have to do uh, other strategies to try to get the right. pain response to, to diminish. Right. But pain is, is the great point of failure for uh, all right. things orthopedic. And a good orthopedist is not going to run away from it. They're going to hang in there and fight for them and keep working with them and say, saying, I had it with you. That's why I say it's a partnership. I have my role and you have your role and we have to get to the finish line right. together and you have to know that I've done my very best to get you to the finish line. It doesn't mean everybody's going to have a perfect outcome but it won't be because I didn't try my best or that we all don't try our best. Yeah. Uh, are there differing techniques for bunion surgery with regards to the foot itself shifting uh, to the outside with weight bearing? I believe there are about 80 operations described for treating 80. bunions. <laughs> so there's a, there's a few. So the take home message is there's not one perfect one, otherwise we'd all do that one. But there are a handful now. There, I th most of those have been dis away. discarded through the process of elimination. But there's still more than one. There's still more than one. And, it de and as is true with the knee replacements, the type of the bunion, the extent of the bunion, the amount of other comorbidity within the foot will determine the extent of the procedure. So the, the answer to the question would be very lengthy if we went through each one individually. They should go to a, a, a specialty trained uh, surgeon to have their, their foot uh, fully investigated. And that's where the, the biomechanics of gait come in and, and that goes back to my days in California and that's why I so enjoy the connection to the, the, the normal human locomotion and what it means to the entire skeleton. Well, and if you look at gaits, every person walks different. I mean, people see me walking down the street and I, they, they saw that it was me because of the way I walk. I mean, we all have that different way. Uh, 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 it's interesting in people who have had joint replacement surgery, after they've recovered, after they have no pain, they'll be walking with a pattern that most people would say is a limp. And I will ask them, well, why are you limping? And they'll say, I'm not limping. This is the way I've walked for 10 years. It's <laughs> not a limp. Used to it. That's yeah. how they walk. <laughs> and that's okay. As long as they're not having pain and they're comfortable, yeah. then that's our goal. What type of exercises are encouraged for someone who has undergone total hip surgery? So we know we've been talking, and we saw Louise talk about knee surgery exercises. What about hip surgery exercises? 
Well, the, the exercises should focus on the, the functional muscles that we use for our activities of daily living. And if you've had a posterior approach, there's a different rehab process than if you've had an anterior approach. And I've heard a lot about that. Everybody's heard that. Oh, he does it anteriorly. I want him to do that. I want the anterior approach because it's better or whatever. Tell me that. In certain patients, it's certainly a good option. I won't tell you that in all patients it's better. I think the surgeon has to know what his or her limitations are, what they're best at, and what they can predictably do to get a good outcome. The final goal of the surgery is to have well-positioned implants, securely fixed to the bone, well-aligned, and with that you'll have a, a good longevity. If they're malpositioned, they'll wear out quickly, they'll fail more quickly. Uh, and so whatever it takes the surgeon to get that. The recovery rates that are, that are uh, measured at six and 12 weeks aren't that much different between anterior and posterior. The pitch for anterior is you get out of the hospital a little earlier, your pain scores are a little lower in that first week that or first two. Week. But I, I've always been inclined to say, if this was a ball game, I want to know what's going on in the bottom of the ninth inning. I'm yeah. not that concerned about the first. top of the first yeah. inning. <laughs> so, Good what, point. Is it true that the older you are when you have a knee replacement, the longer it'll take to recover? <clears throat> Age is not as much of a disqualifier <coughs> a, a, as their fitness level is. Some people are old say at 60. Say that again. The, say, that's such an important point. Now say that one more time. The age is not the disqualifier. It's the fitness level that determines oh. wh whether they're physiologically old or young. Some people are old at 60. Some people are young at 80. So the age doesn't disqualify them. <clears throat> but it will take longer to recover if you're very deconditioned before you come to the operating table. So when patients ask me, can I wait too long? From my perspective regarding the technical aspects of the surgery, not really. It's not harder for me, but it's harder for my partner in this process, my patient, to get better if they've spent the last year or two moving from recliner to couch and, and not being physically active. That's the, that's the impediment to recovery, is their deconditioned state. It's that pre-condition, uh, pre that pre-covery, mm -hmm. that uh, pre prehab, prehab mm -hmm. that matters so much. About a year ago, Dr. Pete Luby of Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls gave us a wonderful lesson about knee surgery. All right, so here we are looking inside Lee's knee. This is the inside half of the knee, what we call the medial side of the knee. And we've stopped it here to give you an idea, and I think we've got this on the telestrator here now too. So this is a loose or torn piece of articular cartilage that's freely floating around inside the knee. And, and Lee had a variety of things that were wrong with the cartilage inside of the knee, and when they tore, he kicked out a bunch of these loose pieces of uh, cartilage, and we found probably a dozen of these pieces float, free-floating around inside the knee. Now this one in particular looked to me like it had come from the articular cartilage of the medial femoral condyle. You can see there's a little bit of a hole back there that kind of matches up with this piece, and that's probably where that came from. We can see in this clip the torn medial meniscus. So again, we're on the inside half or the medial side of the knee. This is the surface of the medial femoral condyle or the femur, the thigh bone as it comes down and forms the top of the knee joint. On the bottom here is the medial tibial plateau and that's the top of the tibia or the leg bone. So it's right where these two bones meet. That's where the hinge happens in the knee. And in that area is the medial meniscus. And this is the inner edge of that medial meniscus here. And then this thing's got a big tear in it that goes up like that. And then this is all kind of shredded up in here. This is a complex tear of the medial meniscus. And uh, you know the reason this hurts is that these pieces that are torn and loose and moving around in here get caught between the two bones, the femur on the top and the tibia on the bottom. And uh, the tolerances inside this knee are such that if you get a loose piece caught between those two bones, it's like somebody stuck you with an ice pick. It doesn't feel good at all. Right. Now, I mean, and the whole point is that you've got this set so that it's pulled apart, but when he's walking, they're smushed together. That's exactly right. So we're right. looking at the, uh, an artificial f space that don't, doesn't it Normally occur. does not exist. Normally those surfaces are right up against each other. Now, this is his ACL right here, Rick. So on this photograph, we're kind of in what we call the notch region. The femur's got this notch in the middle of it where the cruciate ligaments attach, and right. then the tibia is down here on the bottom. And 
right here in the center you're looking at is ACL. There's uh, one edge of it, here's the other edge of it. You can see there's a big blood vessel running down through it there. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, we're all aware of these uh, torn ACLs in athletes, but this is an absolutely perfectly normal looking ACL right there. Where does it tear usually? Uh, it typically in the top half. Usually when we go in, and I just did two ACL reconstructions today, the, the bottom half is almost always well preserved. It tears up in the top half here. It can either tear in the substance or it can tear right off of the femur right up in there. And right now, how are we fixing those with, with your own tendons? Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of different things you can use to make a new ACL. My preference after 25 years of doing this is the middle third of the patellar tendon that we get from the patient, not out of the bone bank. Now we're over on the lateral side. This is the outside half of the knee, and, and I include this mainly to show you what a normal meniscus looks like. And it's not completely normal. You can see that the inner edge of this thing is frayed a little bit in here, but this back third of the meniscus looks very different from his medial meniscus, whereas the medial meniscus had that big tear that was going up like this and it was badly frayed up in here. This lateral meniscus really looks pretty good. So now we've gone through, we've done our full diagnostic arthroscopy, now it's time to start doing a little work to help out Lee. And this uh, tool that you see me using here is a motorized shaver. It's about a sixth of an inch in diameter. It's got a, a, a rotating blade and it's attached to suction and you can see it does a beautiful job of cleaning up that medial femoral condyle where that tear had occurred and that loose piece had gotten shot out into the knee. So now we're going to go back and start cleaning up that torn medial meniscus. I'm going to use the shaver to start with here. You can see it pull in that torn and loose piece and it'll start chewing it away. And all the loose pieces of that then are sucked out or extracted from the joint. So we'll use the shaver to get as much of that material out that's torn as we can. We always, of course, want to leave as much of the healthy tissue in as possible. Finally, we're going to uh, do a little cleanup here with a little punch biter that I've got here. So some of that tissue I can't get off with the shaver, and we have the series of different little punch biters that we can just trim off the torn pieces. And you can see this thing does a nice job of just taking off the torn stuff, getting back to the good, healthy cartilage back there. So on the right side here, we've got the, uh, bef uh, the after, and on the left is the before. So you can see the tear in the medial meniscus, the loose piece, the frayed pieces back here, the rough surface on the medial femoral condyle, and then on the after over here, you can see we've smoothed that femoral condyle out, and I've removed the torn and loose pieces from the medial meniscus and cleaned that up. Well, we had that old record of uh, Pete Luby illustrating that it was such well done. Did you, did you take any uh, disagreement with anything that he said there? No, not at all. In fact, I, I agreed completely with his, his decision to use bone, tendon, bone. It's been my experience that bone heals better to bone than does tendon. Although the studies will tell you that the hamstring grafts are equally effective, but I've been uh, a proponent of the bone, tendon, bone. and. Uh, the technical performance there was was excellent. Nicely done. Really, really Nicely impressive. Done. Uh, you know, uh, medial meniscus tears. I'm seeing a lot of that in 50, 60 year old men in particular. Or, but both, uh, what's your take on on the medial meniscus tears? They're certainly very common. They're generally attritional, meaning over years and years and millions and millions of steps. Uh, their response to surgery is equivocal. Uh, if they are creating mechanical symptoms catching, locking, and popping, then they usually respond quite well to uh, surgical removal of the offending piece of the cartilage. Uh, if they're not, if it's just achy pain, your results are less predictable, although sometimes indicated as well. But again, conservative measures first. Try therapy, try injections, try non-steroidals, try bracing, whatever else is in your bag of conservative options uh, before, and you, go before you go to surgery. So uh, there's this question, and, and I am a proponent of, and you'll know what my side of it is, is if you take too many steps, if you exercise too much, if you're working out too much, if you're stressing those joints and those knees and those ligaments, then you'll bring on osteoarthritis sooner. Um, or if you stress and you exercise and you do all those things, it keeps a joint from wear and tear. That 
that activity is the key to, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, what's your take on, uh, on that? And of course, you know where I'm coming from, but you know, you can, I want to have some disagreement here if there is any. <laughs> well, I think both of your points have merit, and some patients do very well into their 90s uh, with very active lifestyles, and their joints look incredibly healthy on x-ray. And there are people who, in their 50s, have their joints worn out. So there has to be, uh, there have to be other factors at play. It isn't just the wear and tear phenomenon. Sometimes it is, but there are also other genetic issues and others that are brought to bear that cause joints to wear out in people earlier uh, in Even life than others. Even if they were others. regular exercisers. I'm married to a marathon runner for 35 years, and she still runs three to five miles a day, and uh, she gets along fine. She has no pain in her joints, and if I tried to run five miles today, I couldn't possibly. Yeah. So there it goes. But that you play football. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> there that is. So uh, you, you told me a great story about a lawyer you were talking with. You've developed a new friendship. And, uh, and uh, so to, I have to share this one before we get into the next question. I, I knew you would enjoy this. Uh, last week I was having uh, a meeting with a, a fine gentleman who's a retired attorney who is helping us with the Cornerstone Rescue Missions fundraising efforts. One more volunteer thing that you one, do. One more volunteer thing. But, and he is volunteering his time to help us with this task and doing a splendid job, but completely without prompting or solicitation. He asked me, do you ever watch that show, The Prairie Doc? And I said, I do. And he said, that's my favorite show. I learn more on that show. That's why I write a check to public broadcasting every year. And I, I, then I said, well, by the way, I'm going to be on that program next, next week. week. <laughs> and I said, I have to, if with your permission, I'd like to share this with Dr. Holm. Well, we thank you uh, for Mr. your Johnson. friend, Mr. Johnson. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Johnson. And uh, uh, well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be an information center here for everybody and give access to it to all the people some people who are out in the middle of the country far away from any uh, any doctors that are available for uh, care so let's uh, let's get to questions uh, how long will the joint last after someone had a hip replacement surgery or a knee replacement how long do they last oh uh, they can last 25 years I'm coming up on a couple of patients that I uh, took care of in the early 90s whose hips are still functioning fine, some in some quite high demand individuals. Um, activity level will have a bearing. Choice of bearing surface will have an impact too. We've gone through so many different attempts to find the perfect low friction bearing surface. The more friction there is, the more particulate debris you'll generate, the more then your body recognizes that as a foreign material, attacks it and loosens the, the, the implants. We used to call it cement disease because we thought it was the particle cement, and then we realized it could be from polyethylene, it could be from metal, and with the recent evolution of the metal-on-metal -metal articulations, that debris also causes severe reactions that we've had problems with. So we're still working toward that perfect bearing surface, and that's what okay. really lets them last a long time. Well, and that's up to those engineers, you know. Yes, sir. Yes. How do you deal with patients that refuse therapy? You, know, you go, okay, well, you, you really should do this, and they say no. I, I generally would say, your call, baby. I tell them then I really can't help you. If you can't help yourself, then it's hard for me to help you. I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to participate in the process to make you better. Uh, right. you've, you've chosen me uh, to give you the best advice that I can, and I will do that. And here it is. Here it is. Please follow it. And yet some people don't. Yep. And, uh, and some of that uh, is not surgical. I mean, it isn't going to take him to the surgery. It has to do with doing that rehab, getting out and walking every day, you know, that type of thing. As much as we'd like to think we practice an exact science, we both know that medicine is not an exact it science isn't. and never will be. And as much as we, we think we know, uh, we'll see something next week we've never seen before. And that's why I tell my students to never cease to be humble in medicine you will always see something you've never seen before. Right. If, you, if you cease to be humble, you're a fool. So you're teaching uh, in, in Wisconsin uh, once, every summer for a period of weeks, or what in, is that? In the fall. I've been going back for several years in the fall. For me, it's completing the circle of, of my profession. That, that's where I trained. That's where people took time from their busy lives to mentor me, and I'm giving back to them in that way. And I have a, appointments in both orthopedics 
and in anatomy, and then I, I'm also starting to ramp up my teaching here in South Dakota with our students. And I've had a few come with me down to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and I do some periodic noon lectures for the uh, students at the Rapid City campus. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, it's, it's an imperative that those of us who have decades of experience take time to pass yeah. on the, our, no back our, the, the, our knowledge that is now wisdom to the next generation of doctors. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people, I, I, there are some doctors who will say, well, I wouldn't, I would, if I know all of this trouble that I've had to get into, I wouldn't go into medicine again. I don't hear it much. I hear a little bit of it. What's your take on that? I never say anything negative about the profession when I'm with my students. They are at the time of their lives when they should devote their energy to learning as much as they can to be as good as they can be at their chosen profession. And I tell them, take the best of everybody that teaches you and make it yours. Take the best of what you see in me. Take the best in what you see in you. Make it yours and now be that doctor. Uh, and for those in our generation that don't care for the profession, they're not being held against their will. If you really don't like it, I'm sorry for that because I think it's the best job on the planet and I always have. We me can too. do more good for more people in more ways in this work than any other and it's what it never loses its shine for me. Right. It's a pleasure to be able to help people. And it's a privilege to be chosen because patients can choose their doctor. Yeah. They say, a they, they want, when they pick us and say, I want you to help me through this hard thing in my life, there's no higher honor they can pay us. Yeah. And I, I will always feel that way. And that's the way I teach my young doctors. Their, their business now is to learn the practice of medicine. They'll learn the business of medicine in due time. I've got a question here. It says, oh, it's a comment. I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Harlow, so much. In the 90s, Dr. Harlow replaced both my knees. I changed my life forever. I haven't had any issues with knees since. I am forever incredibly grateful to him for his incredible service. Mary Ann Johnson from Rapid City. That's kind of a nice compliment. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. And, and that more than anything illustrates why I love this work because it's the gratitude of the people who trust me enough to choose me as their doctor is what makes this job so wonderful. So thank you, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. And, uh, I'm honored. Well, we appreciate it, and we know her, uh, her well wishes are pointed correctly. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. In the United States, according to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, how many knee replacements are done each year? 175,000, 257,000, 1.25 million, 600,000? The answer is D, 600,000. It was Michael Chapman via email who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Michael, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. Any, t any comment about the number of knee replacements? And I anticipate it's just going to go up because boomers are going into that stand. They're kind of they demand a fair amount, you're these books. You're exactly right. The demographics would suggest that the numbers are going to be increasing. Uh, they're being done at a younger age because of the athletic pursuits of the baby boomers, and uh, we're going to see a spike as the years go by. It is such an effective operation, though, for pain relief that Medicare rates it as number one in their database for dollars spent for value gained. And so... Uh, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Explain that a little bit. Meaning that for the dollar that they spend, the quality of life that the patient realizes by virtue of that procedure is number one in their database. So meaning it's a highly successful operation as long as the doctor and the patient have the partnership that we discussed earlier uh, done correctly and with a willing and, and participating patient, the quality of life can be profoundly enhanced by this type of surgery. The knee surgery and the hip surgery. Hips as well. Very good. We'll be right back after this. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move, too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. It's easy to understand why the field of orthopedics and the ordinary treatment of fractures greatly improved during the last few years of the 1800s when x-rays were discovered. But in the beginning, it was hard to anticipate all the implications x-rays and radiation would have. In 1895, while working with a cathode ray tube in his laboratory in Germany, 
Wilhelm Conrad Rankin noted a fluorescent glow in crystals positioned a few feet away. He noted that while metal and bone seemed to block the passing of this glow-causing ray, black paper or soft human tissue did not. Rankin named his discovery X-radiation or X-ray and illustrated utility right off the bat with the famous picture of the bones of his wife Bertha's hand on a photographic plate. After announcing his discovery, the scientific community just virtually exploded with interest. X-rays were defined as electromagnetic waves of the same nature as light, but invisible to the eye, and yet with the astonishing ability to pass through solid matter. Within six months after Rankin's announcement, battlefield surgeons were using the new X-ray in finding bullets in wounded soldiers. Not much later, after improvements with X-ray tubes, physicians were using so-called Rankinograms to accurately set bones and dentists to improve the work on teeth. At about the same time, a French scientist noted that photographic plates all wrapped in black paper placed in a drawer became exposed as if to light when pieces of pitch blend ore, or later called uranium ore, was in the same drawer. Two years later, in 1898, the wife and husband scientific team Marie and Pierre Curie further refined from pitch blend the elements uranium, named after the Greek god Uranus, polonium, named after Marie's homeland of Poland, and radium, named after Latin word radius, for beam or ray, like the spokes of a wheel. We've learned that the waves, or gamma rays, coming from these radioactive elements are about 10,000 times shorter than X-rays, which in turn are 6,000 times shorter than that of visible light. The dangerous effects of radiation from X-rays and gamma rays were not discovered until many of the scientists working in this realm started losing limbs having non-healing ulcers, or developing life-threatening cancers. Marie Curie herself lost her life prematurely to a depleted bone marrow condition called aplastic anemia. But the other side of the story brings to light all the uses for these short waveforms, but especially how both X-rays and gamma radiation have proven so beneficial in diagnosing and treating the illnesses of the human condition. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. Mark Harlow. Thanks, Mark, for donating your time. You're getting here on your own dime and giving you, again, one more gift to the society. Thanks also for Tom Dempster for the pictures that adorn the set this season. Uh, his artistic skills enhance our show greatly. Thank you, Tom. I visited with state epidemiologist Dr. Lon Keitlinger earlier today. He said West Nile virus season is still going strong in South Dakota. We currently have 95 cases reported. This number is going higher and we're going to have a big year. Last year we had 40 cases all season. So we're gonna triple that number this year. Please, if you're outside, wear long sleeve shirts and long pants, put on bug repellent with DEET. Be sure that there are no areas of standing water around your home. Zika is not a concern in South Dakota, but West Nile is. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. 
We had had many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of the show. Let's get started. I have a grandson who is 17 and he has scoliosis and he needs to have rods put in his back. He refuses because he doesn't want to give up sports. What do you think of that? Ooh, rods in the back for scoliosis. C complicated question, complicated disease process. Uh, at 17, he is probably through his growth spurt. Uh, right. that, that's an important factor as to when you decide to operate on a scoliosis. Uh, statistically, he would be past his growth spurt at that age. The curve usually accelerates during the time of the growth spurt, so it's probably maximized at this point. But when the curve gets to a certain point, it's more likely to progress as the years go by, and that would be an indication for surgical stabilization and or correction. And that's a pretty significant curve though, isn't it? It'd be a, in the 40 plus category for, for most surgeons. Um, 40, de 40, 40, grade, so 40 it's degrees of a curve measured from the top to the bottom of that curve. So it, it's, it's a clearly visible curve to uh, a non-medical person. They're, you, they're sometimes well compensated. You can have a curve in the, the rib cage part of your spine and have a compensatory curve in the lower back part of your spine. So with a shirt on, it's fairly well masked, but when the shirt's off, you can see it you usually see quite it. plainly. Generally, when they bend over, mm -hmm. uh, you can see the hump. There'll be a rib prominence because part of the disease process is rotation of the vertebra, which in turn rotates the ribs with it. So it's, it's a tough call. Um, unless there's an underlying reason. Idiopathic scoliosis is very different from the kinds of scoliosis that are caused by other diagnoses. Idiopathic uh, meaning we don't know what the heck is it. We don't know what causes it. It's a spontaneous uh, process that we don't know really Other why. causes would be polio or any neurologic. Neurofibromatosis. Uh, there are spinal muscle atrophies that can cause them with different characteristics in their curves. Uh, to the grandmother who's asking this question, uh, I would recommend a second opinion would be a worthy consideration. And I don't know who her first opinion is, and, and I don't care. Uh, I'm of the belief that we should all never be too proud to ask for a second opinion. If we all read the same books and follow the same ethical guidelines, we should get the same answer, irrespective of which right. doctor we go to. Right. So if she's concerned or, or not clear uh, or isn't getting her questions answered, a second opinion is, is always appropriate. And I commonly tell patients that any doctor that doesn't want a second opinion is a prob probably a doctor you should not see. Right. If that doctor gets offended and, and uh, pitches a fit, then you need another doctor. Pick another doctor. If he or she said, great, and that will give you reassurance if that answer is what you need. Full speed ahead. Um, I, please explain a partial knee and what condition is best addressed by this procedure. I have bone on bone in, on inside the right knee might I be a candidate for partial knee? Might be, might be. And, and by that, uh, it's surgeon judgment. The partials don't have quite as good a track record as the totals, but if the patient truly has what we call unicompartmental disease, meaning the lateral compartment is, assuming medial compartment, it could be lateral. The other side of the knee is in good health. The articular cartilage is healthy. The meniscal cartilage is healthy. The kneecap articulation is healthy and it really is truly one component, one compartment, then it's a worthy consideration in the right hands. But they have to be very carefully aligned, otherwise the bending moments can cause it to, uh, to fail early. Alignment is the key. Yes, sir. I have knee buckling lately, and my hand will jerk also. I'm going to have a brain MRI tomorrow. Dr. Holm, any ideas what it could be? Well, I would ask you too, Mark. Knee buckling lately, all of a sudden they're walking along and then a knee goes out, and also the hand is jerking. Uh, it's almost not enough for me to, to, to get the answer there. Um, I, I, I sense that there might be knee buckling in one side only would imply that there's weakness on one side. The hand jerking, um, I don't understand what that is. I don't. Uh, any clues? Or My sense though is a, a neurologic uh, problem is certainly worth looking at and I go along with the brain MRI. Right. What she has now are symptoms. We don't have a diagnosis. Another point of emphasis for me with my students is to always emphasize that we need to find a diagnosis. Patients come to us with symptoms. We have physical signs on our examination. We do imaging studies, but we need to come to a diagnosis because without the right diagnosis, we can't render the right treatment. So she has symptoms that at this time 
uh, have not defined a diagnosis. So is the knee buckling because the quadriceps is weak? Is the knee buckling because she has a meniscal tear? Is the hand jerking because she's having partial seizures? Is it from the, the cervical spine? Is it from seizures? All of these things are in the realm of the possible. So her physician needs to start to narrow down the diagnostic possibilities and an MRI is a reasonable place to start if he believes it is neurogenic yeah. in, in origin. Right. Neurogenic, meaning from the brain or the spine or the nerves. I just wanted to thank you. That was that thank you from Marianne Johnson. I love that. I have a loud crack in my knee and it just gave out on me. PA says, based on x-ray, they won't do a scope unless I feel more pain. Had a loud crack and it just gave out on me. And I agree with the PA that that isn't an indication for surgery. A, a crepitant joint is pretty common, from knuckles cracking to kneecaps cracking. If it doesn't hurt, it probably doesn't represent a pathologic process, right, a so, disease process. So cracking or crackling or snapping and popping when you bend your knee, I have that, uh, and I'm, I ran eight miles today, and I'm, uh, I, I think that uh, that's pretty common. It doesn't mean anything. And in shoulders, it's common as well. So unless there's pain associated with it, uh, it's leave it alone. I, but it gave out on her. And so the question I have is uh, giving out is another story. Sometimes people hear a noise and then it frightens them and they, they, they move in a different direction. I would, I would be careful about that. Certainly, scoping, uh, is this is not enough for a scoping. No. Again, there's no diagnosis. There's no indication in this day and age for exploratory surgery, given the wonderful imaging technology that the physicists have provided us. With their MRIs, we can see into virtually every body part and have a clear diagnosis. Crepitance and is that sound that you, you, or that, that you feel if you put your hand over the knee and you move the knee back and forth and you go grind, 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 grind. Yes. Do you believe that that is always indicative of the severity of the problem or not? Not. No, because it can be from soft tissue as well. Uh, on the outside of the knee is a structure called the iliotibial band, which very commonly rubs across the outside of the knee bone, and it gives that sensation of catch and grinding. It can be soft, it can be hard uh, in different people. It doesn't mean the kneecap's unhappy, and again, pain is the indication to proceed. Pain is the body's alarm system, and if the alarm's not ringing, then we don't need to chase it far. But I would say as an internist, a lot of people have pain and it doesn't necessarily mean as well that there's something bad going on. Sometimes you explore, of course you should explore, but sometimes you don't find an answer and it means let's give it a little bit more time. It's sort of like that feeling you have when there's a, a, a zit that's kind of dwelling inside there and it wants to come out and you're not, you're not gonna wanna squeeze it. You don't do anything, you just put heat on it and you go, what is it gonna do? Let's see how it manifests itself over time. I had a total knee replacement two years ago. I continue to have a burning sensation in the kneecap. I f it feels like I have a rug burn or something of the sort. Surgeon recommends I wear a hinged knee brace. I have no relief from the pain thoughts. This is a burning sensation on, in the kneecap. Okay. When we do the incision for a total knee, right down the middle, Right we almost always cut the saphenous nerve as it crosses the midline. That can sometimes develop a neuroma. And that neuroma can create this kind of burning pain right in the front of the kneecap that this gentleman is, is or this patient is, is describing. describing. Um, a hinge you, kneecap, do you, a uh, hinge knee brace, do you, what do you do for a uh, neuroma? I'd inject it first. I, I would check a tenel sign to see if I can isolate the spot where that nerve is most tender. And then I would inject it liberally with a steroid with, with and Marcane and a steroid. And I had a gentleman in uh, in the VA hospital in Milwaukee when I was staffing cases there a couple yeah. of years ago, who came in with this identical symptom. And in the clinic, we injected his knee. He came back in ten minutes later and said, "I can't believe it. My pain is gone." I hope this is that simple. I hope this resolution is that simple. I'd try that first. If the pain doesn't go away with that, then I would be uh, concerned about patellar alignment. Is the patellar implant sitting right in the center of the thigh bone component, the, what we call the trochlear groove? Because patellar misalignment is one of the leading causes of total joint replacement Problem. unhappiness. Yeah. Surgeon recommends a hinged knee brace. 
I'm, that's not been your go-to player. wouldn't be my, my choice, no disrespect intended, but the hinges are usually to stabilize the joint unless this person has other instability issues. I can't see where that would be a benefit. What, uh, what about rotator cuff replacement? What do you think about shoulder, rotator cuff? Repair? Repair and replacement. This guy said replacement. Well, we generally... Total shoulders. Total shoulder replacements uh, are a good pain relieving option. Rotator cuff repairs are common. Um, they're successful if the tear is relatively fresh and not retracted and not chronic. The, the greater the chronicity, the longer that tear has been there, the more the tendon has retracted, the more the muscle has been replaced with fibrous tissue and is non-contractile, the less likely you're going to have a successful repair. So early on, it's, it's like fixing an Achilles tendon or any other tendon. They, they generally do well, but if they're chronic and severe, then they become what we call irreparable rotator cuff tears. And we generally don't operate on them until they've done extensive therapy, had extensive conservative options, and until they get to a certain, I don't want to say age, because it isn't as age dependent as it is uh, activity dependent, but we will then try a reverse total shoulder, which is where the cup uh, goes on to the humerus and the ball goes into the, the scapula, which is the usual right. inverse of oh, what, wow. what we do. And there have been good reports for pain relief. You don't ever get great function back. But you if don't you fix it before the muscle is atrophied, mm -hmm. I mean, the muscle's just been separated from the function that it was doing. Right. And it's not, yeah, unless you fix that, the muscle goes away. It does. If and then you can't get it to come back. It doesn't come back well. Nope. Never as good as the original equipment. My heel bone on my left ankle is split from an old basketball injury in 1971. Heel bone, left ankle, split. My doctor wants to put it back in place by grafting bone out of my shin into my heel bone. I was wondering if that surgery will have any effect on my Achilles tendon. Heel bone, ankle, split, graft bone, Achilles tendon. I don't think it'll affect the Achilles. Uh, I think that if, 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 if they can still point toes down and point toes up, uh, the, if the operation is just to rebuild the calcaneus to give that person a better platform to stand on, then it shouldn't affect the attachment of the Achilles. Right. If there's a fusion planned as well, which would probably be the more common operation to fuse the talus and the calcaneus together, then you will get decreased range of motion for both dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, but the Achilles is still an essential uh, component of your stability and your gait cycle. Okay. I think that does our questions, after hours questions. Thank you very much, Mark, for My your pleasure. help. This has been great. Thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all your questions and the opportunity to answer them. Until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. Provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota State Medical Association, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Stanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Regional Health, and Swiftel Communications.